if you're a student and you're listening to me or you're reading this book, you have the potential to be a great investor in the future. It's possible, but I think it's better to start in your 20s and 30s building a great reputation as an investor and skill set than trying to start in your 50s or 60s or 70s. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and on today's episode, I'm joined by David Rubenstein. David, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. David, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. I wanted to start off the conversation by having you talk a bit about your story. You co-founded one of the largest global private equity firms in the world, managing over $376 billion in assets. And what was really interesting to me about when I was learning about your story is that you started this company with no experience in the field. You pivoted careers at the age of 37. So I'd just love to have you talk a bit about your story for our listeners and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Um, I grew up in Baltimore in the United States. I am um, a college educated. I went to college at Duke and law school at the University of Chicago. My parents were not college or high school educated. Um, they were blue collar workers. I was their only child. I got scholarships to go to college and law school. My ambition was not to make money, but it was to uh, uh, really go into government and politics. I worked briefly after practicing law in New York for President um, Carter in the White House. I say briefly, it was all four years of his term. When he lost the election in 1980, I went back and practiced law. I wasn't really that good a lawyer in my view, so I decided to start an investment firm in Washington called the Carlisle Group. I started it with $5 million that I raised from four investors. And today, as uh, you mentioned, we now manage $376 billion, and it's become one of the largest private equity firms in the world. So you mentioned you started Carlisle in Washington, and can you speak a bit about why you chose that? Was there any type of opportunity you saw there? Well, as a general rule of thumb, most entrepreneurs start companies where they happen to live. Now, obviously, Jeff Bezos famously drove across the country to start Amazon in Seattle, where he hadn't lived. But generally, people tend to start companies where they live. I lived in Washington. After I left the White House, I practiced law there. And I also thought that in Washington, we would be a little unique because most of the private equity firms in the United States were then in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. By being based in Washington, I think I could correctly say we understand companies heavily affected by the federal government better than the people, let's say, in Los Angeles. Now, maybe that was true, maybe not, but I thought it was probably true. And we brought into the firm many people who had served in the federal government at senior positions to give us more credibility in that area. So Secretary of State Jim Baker, George Herbert Walker Bush after he finished as president, Frank Carlucci as Secretary of Defense, those kind of people. And that gave us credibility in the in the, in the the space of trying to say we understand the federal government better than people in New York or Los Angeles. So you've also been a student of history and you've written two books on American history. I'm just curious to know if you think studying history has kind of made you a better investor or if it's influenced your strategy at all in any way. Well, I think it's helpful to understand history because the theory of understanding history has always been if you understand what happened in the past, you can see the mistakes that were made in the past, and then you theoretically would not make those mistakes in the future. Of course, people do make the same mistakes over and over again. But uh, Sir John Templeton, one of the most famous investors in our country in the last century or so, said famously that the most dangerous words in the English language are this time – is different, which is to say, when you think that uh, you've never seen something happen in the markets before, and you say it's never happened before, it's different, you're making a mistake because the markets tend to repeat themselves. So um, I do think understanding history is helpful. Yes. So as we just talked about, you grew your firm from being a shop in Washington, kind of based on sectors that are most impacted by government, to now one of the largest global private equity firms in the world. I'm, and you were also, um, I've read an article that said your firm invests largely in emerging markets in China. Um, but I'm wondering, has that changed in recently, and is your conviction still strong in that market? Well, remember, uh, most of the people in the world live in the emerging markets. So after Carlisle uh, began to become a well-known investor in the developed markets, that, that would be United States, Canada, uh, Australia, Japan, and Western Europe, 
we began to look in the emerging markets, as they were called. And, uh, you know, of course, in the emerging markets, you're including countries like China and India, Brazil, countries with large populations and great potential. The bloom is probably off the rose on emerging markets just because the economy in the world is challenged because of what's going on in Russia, Ukraine and other supply chain issues. There's no doubt that it's not as easy to make big profits in uh, in emerging markets as it might have been a few years ago. Nonetheless, the emerging markets have the biggest populations in the world and populations represent consumers. And therefore, I think in time, uh, being in emerging markets will prove to be very profitable for people that stick with it. We are still a large investor in the emerging markets, though we have not uh, renewed our fund in, in Africa. We had a fund in Africa. We had one in the Middle East. We had one in Latin America. Uh, we are investing in those areas through other funds now without dedicated funds just to Africa, let's say. But on the other hand, we do have a large dedicated fund to Asia, which includes China, India, Southeast Asia. And that's still a very important market for us. Curious to know which markets are you most bullish on right now? Where do you see the most opportunities in, I guess, the near term? In the terms of geography, or is that what you mean? Or you mean uh, sectors? Yeah, I guess maybe both geography and then if there's any sectors particularly. Well, um, let's talk about geographies. Uh, the United States, in my view, is still the most attractive place in the world to invest because got a very stable and strong currency. Uh, you have a large population. You've got uh, the financial markets are quite robust and sophisticated, a large executive base, and you have uh, an entrepreneurial spirit. And I think a government regulatory uh, apparatus that is not discouraging of entrepreneurial activities. So I think that's the number one place. The question is, what about Europe? Europe is maybe not quite as attractive as the United States. It's probably going into somewhat of a recession. It's had some challenges recently because of what's going on in Ukraine. In terms of the uh, China and India, we are still a large investor in uh, those areas, but uh, India has turned out to be more attractive in recent uh, year or two than maybe China. As we all know, China has had a bit of a regulatory crackdown on some technology companies, so it's harder to either get an investment in China or to exit those deals on favorable terms. One of the problems in China in recent two years or so has been that Western investors have not been able to really physically go to China because of COVID constraints and so forth. So it's been hard to make meaningful investments in China when you can't go there. Now, we do have people who live in China, but a lot of our people that are investment professionals live in Hong Kong, and they still find it sometimes difficult to go to China. So on the whole, I would say we are uh, more attracted to um, uh, India at the moment than we might have been uh, a few years ago. India is still a pretty strong economy. It's got a very good uh, uh, educated population. China will always be uh, probably the, the most attractive emerging markets over a longer period of time just because it has a large population base and it has a you know somewhat capitalist oriented in some respects um, economic system, not as capitalist oriented, of course, as we would prefer as it is in the United States. But so we, we're attracted to China, we're attracted to India, still very attracted to Japan, um, and of course, Europe as well. In terms of sectors, we very, we very much believe that healthcare is a very growing area. When I worked in the White House in the late 1970s in the United States, the percentage of GDP devoted to healthcare was roughly 7 or 8%. Now it's about 21 or 22%. And that's because the population is aging. But you have more sophisticated uh, medical technologies. People have greater ambitions of what they can do with their healthcare treatments. And so, therefore, that's been a big in sector uh, for us. Uh, also, has uh, um, financial tech or fintech has been a big growth area for us and for others. And so, that's an area that we are investing in uh, heavily as well. I want to touch on a couple of things there. So, you mentioned that the U.S., you think, is still one of the best markets to invest in going forward. Some people are kind of skeptical of it going forward, given the large amount of debt that we currently have. So I'm wondering what your views are on this and the impact it could have on the financial markets. The United States has a staggering amount of debt. Um, I would say the beginning of this century, the amount of debt that the United States had was probably maybe five or six trillion dollars. Now it's roughly 30 trillion dollars. 
And all of the presidents in the 20th century have added an enormous amount, the 21st century have had an enormous amount of debt. Um, we're able to service it because interest rates are relatively low. They're, they're obviously going up. And two, we have the only reserve currency, and therefore people are willing to buy our dollars. So if there were five reserve currencies, uh, I don't think we would be able to find as many buyers as interested in our dollars as, as the case. But as long as people are willing to buy dollars because they realize the dollars will be uh, re repurchased in effect or we be we, worth par at some point and the interest is being paid, people are still, I think, going to buy dollars for a long time. And our treasury bills are things we can market. I do think that the debt level is too high in the United States. And at some point, if interest rates keep going higher, it'll be harder and harder to sustain that debt. And the only way out of it is inflating your way out of it or cutting uh, – spending, which is hard, or increasing taxes, which is hard. There's no easy way out of it. And what you usually find in these kind of situations is that governments tend to, knowingly or not, inflate their way out of the debt problem. And then you mentioned that you've maybe cut back on some investments in China recently. I'm just wondering, how do you think about the risks associated with those investments? Well, China is a great place to invest. It's been a little challenging lately. Uh, for regulatory and other reasons. And obviously, the U.S.-China relationship is not all that would be desired. Hopefully, when President Biden meets with uh, Xi Jinping, uh, which will probably occur at the uh, G20 summit in Asia, I hope that maybe there can be a reduced uh, level of tension. But right now, it's it's obviously a bit challenging. And, um, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. But um, hopefully, it'll get better. I want to talk to you a little bit about Carlyle Group, as your private equity firm is a public company, and the EPS growth over the past three years has been 59%. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit to us about how you see the company's growth going forward. Well, it's difficult to say um, the specifically things, and I have, you know, there are legal constraints in what I can say because I am uh, co-chairman of the board. And I, I cannot provide any non-public information, but I would say that um, Carlisle is, I think, in good shape. Our last quarterly numbers are public, and I think they reflected some, some real strengths. Um, I would say that all the private equity firms in the United States are doing reasonably well because there's a fair amount of uh, opportunities there. We all have a fair amount of capital to invest. We have dedicated professionals. We're highly incented to do well. We invest a lot of them, our own money alongside our investors' money. So I think the prospects for the growth of the entire industry is very good, and Carlisle's part of the industry. I've read some recent numbers that the private equity sector as a whole, interest in it has grown substantially over recent years. Do you have any comments on why that is? Well, of course, I like to think it's because of the good looks of the founders of these firms, but nobody else thinks that. So I think it's because over the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, and 30 years, private equity firms' returns have exceeded the returns of public market in indexes or returns by a fair amount. So as people observe the situation, they see that private equity firms on average will outperform public markets on average. And if you're fortunate enough to be in a top quartile private equity firm, you can dramatically outperform public market averages. So I think people consistently think that when you have people incented as well as people in private equity are by getting a piece of the profits uh, and they're investing a lot of their own money alongside their investors, that's a pretty good bet. So I think that that's, that's why the growth is so great. It's also great because there's a lot more people coming into the markets who want to get these returns. So you now have not only public pension funds in the U.S., which were a big source of capital, but sovereign wealth funds, family offices, and now retail investors are coming into private equity as well. So for our listeners that are interested in participating in the returns of private equity funds, I'm wondering if you think there's anything different they should look at in terms of analyzing if a firm, a private equity firm is a good investment compared to public companies. Is there anything different they should look for? Well, public companies have a lot of information that's readily available. But I'd say when you're looking at a fund, a private equity fund, look at the track record. Make certain the people that produce the track record are still there. Make certain that the firm is a reputation for integrity. 
make certain it doesn't get sued for fraudulent activities or things like that all the time. Uh, make certain that the investors in the firm or the professionals in the firm are investing a large part of their own money alongside the investors. Make certain you understand the fee structure. Make certain you can get uh, information on an updated basis on how your funds are performing. Uh, make certain that uh, people uh, who are investing there are people you know or know of because if you're, if you're smart people will know who the good funds are and where the best funds are. And if you don't know who any of the investors are um, and you've never heard of any of the investors, that's probably not a good sign. So those are the things people should look at investing in private equity funds. We kind of touched on this before, but I'm just curious, since Carlisle was kind of founded on investing in those industries most impacted by government, over the years, there's been a shift um, away from that, perhaps as it's become larger and global firm. I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit about that change in strategy and what kind of led to that? Was it just better growth prospects? Well, what led to it is as the firm got bigger, we were investing more uh, money, not just in the U.S., but outside. And so, therefore, we had to adapt and, and develop expertise in areas not affected by the federal government. So we don't invest in areas affected by the federal government, for example, in Europe, particularly, or, or in Asia. But I do think by having an understanding of, of government and by being based in Washington, I do think we have an edge that enables us to you know, understand how governments can impact uh, for the good and bad uh, companies that are operating in, in, in a variety of different sectors. So I want to switch gears a little bit now because you have a new book coming out next month called How to Invest Masters on the Craft, where you interview many of the world's top investors, including Larry Fink, Ray Dalio, Stan Drunkenmiller, John Rogers, Ron Barron, just to name a few, and you document what drove their success. So I'm curious to know, after spending all that time writing it and interviewing them all, what do you think are the most important things or common traits you identified among them that you think was key in driving their success? Well, all of these individuals have certain traits in common. I think it's probably true of any industry. If you pick the leaders, you'll probably see they have certain things in common. But the things that these in industry leaders have are these. Number one, they come from middle class families by and large, maybe in some cases blue collar families. They generally don't come from the wealthiest families in the world. Secondly, they tended to do very well academically. Many have advanced degrees. They tend not to be uh, people who are uh, uneducated. Uh, third, they tend to be very intellectually curious. They're always asking the questions. They're always reading as much as they can. They tend to be uh, people who are uh, able to make a mistake and get over it relatively quickly. They don't labor over their mistakes and try to convince people they're right when, in fact, they were wrong. They are people that are most importantly are willing to defy conventional wisdom, which is to say they're willing to take risks that other people say is not a good thing to do. So if you look at the most famous investors, the ones I interviewed, almost all of them have picked an area to invest in at one point or another where everybody has said that's a bad thing to do. But they're willing to be strong enough to overcome that uh, conventional wisdom. That's another important uh, opportunity or another important trait that they have. I think they also have the trait of being willing to share the credit, but also they like to make the final decision. They generally like to, don't like to delegate investment decisions to their teams. They want to pull the, the final trigger. And finally, I'd say they're all philanthropic. Generally, when you're an investor, you tend to make a fair amount of money. And when you do, you have more money to do with than you might need for your daily living. And so they tend to become fairly philanthropic and very, and very significant and philanthropic leaders. That was one big thing that kind of stuck out to me was they all seem to make those big contrarian bets. I'm wondering if you could just walk us through an example of maybe an investor in the book that made a big contrarian or against the grain bet and what all led and factored into the success of that particular investment. Well, perhaps the, the most famous uh, trade in recent decades has been the famous trade made by John Paulson, a hedge fund manager in New York, who shorted, in effect, the market for subprime mortgage loans in the 06, 07, 08 period. Uh, now, obviously, many people thought subprime mortgages were great because they tended to pay investors higher interest rates, and the prospect of their defaulting was not commonly thought to be a real big risk. 
John Paulson thought differently. He did a lot of work on it, and he concluded that he could have a pretty attractive trade if, if these mortgages defaulted, and as we know, they did. So he made roughly, with for himself and his investors, roughly $20 billion on one investment concept. And at the time, while we now know that the mortgage market was probably ripe for these kind of defaults, many people thought he was making a big mistake. They thought it wasn't possible to short this much big of a market. They also thought he was risking his own firm by putting so much of the firm's capital at risk. So it was a contrary bet, but it turned out to be very good. I'm also wondering how that same wisdom applies today. So what do you think, what kind of investments would be ones that go against the grain in today's environment? Well, today, um, it's generally thought that technology companies have had the air out of their uh, uh, taken out of their valuations and that investing in technology companies today is a bit risky. And so a lot of people who are um, interested in good returns are looking elsewhere and not looking at technology companies because it's thought that the valuations were too high. They've come down a bit and probably there's not so much upside in the future because valuations won't go back to where they were. But in truth, uh, I think the valuations probably will come back. And I think we're in a, a slowing, slow economy right now in the United States. And I think a contrary bet today would be to invest in some in, in some technology-related companies. Another contrary bet today would be to invest in cryptocurrencies. The conventional wisdom amongst people my generation or so is that crypto is not really something that has real substance to it. But in your generation and the younger investors, they have a very, very strong interest in investing in crypto or crypto-related companies, particularly those that use blockchain technologies. So for older people, I would say investing in crypto is a bit of a contrarian uh, bet because it's thought to be not all that safe and secure. So that's another example. I am curious to get your particular thoughts on crypto. How do you think about them playing a role in your investment portfolio? Is it more of a short-term speculative trade, or do you think of it long-term? As a general rule of thumb, investment trends tend to be ones that are generated initially by younger people. Usually, the, the, the new trends don't come from people in their 70s or 80s. They come from people in their 20s or 30s. And so... Just as people in their 20s or 30s were excited about personal computers years ago or smartphones or buying things over the Internet, people in my generation missed all that. So when Jeff Bezos was starting his company, uh, many people like me told him it wasn't going to work. Uh, we didn't realize how much uh, the world would depend on buying things over the Internet. We didn't really understand the Internet. And so today, I would say uh, many people in my generation are skeptical that crypto can really produce long sustained returns. On the other hand, uh, younger people think that, seem to think that it, while it has its risk, it's not going away. And I do think the U.S. government is not going to overly regulate uh, crypto. I also think that in my own case, what I've done is through my family office, invested in companies that service the industry of crypto. That makes it possible for me to invest in the industry without having to pick one currency versus another currency. So I'm wondering, going back to that contrarian way of thinking, is that a strategy that you also use? And do you have any examples of a contrarian bet that worked out well for you? Well, I guess Carla was the best contrarian bet that I made because people didn't think that was going to work. But I'd say Carla, um, over the years and my family office over the years, have invested in uh, areas that people were thought not to be that attractive. For example, Carla became a large investor in China when that wasn't considered to be that easy to do. We also became a large investor in Japan when that was not considered to be a great private equity market. We've invested in um, many different types of uh, sectors that people didn't think initially would be that attractive, like aerospace defense, for example. But um, there's a number of contrarian bets we've made, and you know we've made some that didn't work out. But on the whole, I think the firm has done quite well. I think the hardest thing about being a contrarian investor is that maybe realizing when you're wrong, because there are going to be times when your bet isn't right. And I'm just wondering, how do you navigate those situations when to realize to cut your losses versus stick to your conviction? That's a very complicated uh, problem for people like me, because I tend to hold on to my mistakes longer than I probably should and don't cut my losses quickly enough. 
uh, great investors are people that see they made a mistake and then they go on to the next thing and they don't think about it again. I still talk about the fact that I could have invested in Facebook 30 years ago when Mark Zuckerberg was in college or 20 years ago, and I didn't. I, I could have uh, bought Amazon, um, you know, relatively cheaply and didn't do that. Or, you know, I, I think I probably don't cut my losses probably as much as I, sh I, I should. Um, but that that's a, a, one of my faults, many faults. I've heard you talk about those two deals before, so I'm curious, um, your learnings from those experiences, is there anything investors can take away? Is it kind of go with your gut when you have a good feeling about an investment or? When it's something new, ask younger people what they think. You know, very often you'll see on investment committees of organizations, uh, people who are 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old. These I'm talking about, let's say, nonprofit organizations that have investment committees or even other organizations. You know, probably listening to younger people about what they think is good is, is not a bad idea. For example, when um, Mark Andreessen came to my office when he was starting a company that later became known as Netscape, he told us that he had invented, uh, helped to develop something called Mosaic, which helped navigate the Internet. And we said to him, well, what is the Internet and why would you want to navigate it? And so we didn't know much about what he was talking about. And obviously that was a mistake. So I think uh, you can't read too much, I've said before, but also keep in touch with the younger people because they're going to spot trends much more than the older people are going to spot trends. So circling back to your book, what was also interesting to me about all these investors that you talk about is that they all have very different investing strategies, very different paths that kind of led to their success. But I'm wondering if there's anything common among them all in their strategy that you would like to point out that you think is just important, or was it just more so that they became a master at their own craft? Well, they tended to specialize in things. There are very few people that are so good that they can do every different type of investment. So I divided the book into different categories, the venture investors, distressed debt investors, ESG investors. And so I think it's important to recognize your areas of strength and weakness. And I think each of these investors tended to focus on one area and made it their own. And I think that's an important thing to do. No investor can know everything about everything. So try to find an area that is your own and, and make it your own and study as much as you can about it and read as much as you can. And I tried to, uh, the book is written not just about the insights of these famous investors uh, and their backgrounds, but it's designed for three different types of people. People who are students uh, or young people that are thinking about a career in investing and kind of tells them, you know, what things they, they should do and how they might prepare. Secondly, for average people who are not professional investors, but who want to learn how to be or do some investing on their own, but do it directly, like they might buy real estate uh, themselves, or they might buy a company or something like that. And then there's the third category of people which is more typical, which is people that invest in funds. They could be private equity funds or mutual funds, what they should be looking for when they do that. And I, I try to remind people that by reading this book, you're not going to become uh, Warren Buffett. Just like when I read a book on Tiger Woods, I didn't become a great golfer. You can't read a book and all of a sudden become great at something. But over a period of time, you can get to be better than you were before if you do research, you work at it, and you, and you try to put real time into something. I'm curious to know, after studying all of these investors and their strategies, as well as from your own experience, where do you think the greatest opportunities come from? Is it, or the biggest wins? Is it uncertain times in down markets? Or is there something else? Or can a good investor just make money in any market, you think? Well, the really great investors tend to do well in good and bad times. But the most common mistake that investors make is they get out of the markets when the market is down and they get in the markets and the markets are going up. And rarely are people able to top the, uh, you know, time the, the markets well enough to really figure out when to get in and when to get out. The best thing to do, in my view, is when the markets are going down, that's when you invest. And when markets are going up, that's when you have to be much more cautious. Now, people might say, well, the markets are going down. I want to wait till it hits the bottom. Trying to figure out when it's going to hit the bottom is almost impossible, just like it's almost impossible to figure out when the market's going to hit a top. You don't have to wait for the top or the bottom. 
But if you think that prices are attractive, like when markets are down as they are now, now is a much better time to invest than, than when the markets are very high. And I would also, also add that many of the great fortunes in the world have been made by investors who bought things when markets were depressed and not when they were very, uh, you know, high, high, highly priced. Uh, this is often called value investing. Value investing is what Warren Buffett is basically about. It's in effect what he would say is buying uh, something that's worth a dollar for 50 cents or what he used to call uh, cigar butts, you know, things that people throw away and that aren't really uh, thought to be worth much and you can buy them at a discount. And, and Seth Klarman, who I wrote about in the book as well, is also a great value investor. And I think right now is a good time to be a value investor because prices are down. I'm glad you mentioned that. A lot of our listeners might follow that Warren Buffett style value investing approach. It's kind of what our flagship show, We Study Billionaires, was founded on. And so I'm just wondering, you mentioned Seth Klarman that you wrote about in the book. He was able to consistently deliver net returns of nearly 20%. Can you talk a bit about his strategy? What made his value investing strategy different than maybe Warren Buffett's perhaps? Well, of course, Warren's been doing it for longer than anybody. Warren has averaged 20% a year for 60 years, six zero years, 20% a year, pretty good. Uh, Seth Klarman's younger. But he is still somebody that is considered one of the best value investors out there. And what he's done is from, from a perch called Baupost, B-A-U-P-O-S-T in Boston, his hedge fund um, has consistently done very, very well, as you point out. But he's had incredible discipline in recent years to avoid investing when markets were very ebullient. Many people would say to him, you're sitting on a lot of cash. 30% or so of your entire hedge fund is in cash. There's not That's not earning a lot. But he resisted the temptation to go buy things because they were, you know, very popular or they seemed to be going up even more. He st stuck to his discipline of buying things for, you know, that, that are worth a lot um, less than they're trading for, I, I should say. And so that's what he tended to do. And he's done quite well. And I think recently, as prices have come down, his value investing style has, has done quite well. I think we're often maybe told as investors that sitting on cash is a bad thing, but what are your views on that? Like holding on to maybe more cash at some points to wait for a good opportunity. Do you think that is a better approach perhaps? Well, some investors say that. I mean, Ray Dalio for a while was saying, I'm not sure if he still says it now, I mean, he might, uh, cash is trash, which is to mean don't hold on to cash because it's going to yield, you know, 1% or less. And so put your money at work where it's going to earn more than the cash return that you might get in a bank. Um, I think it's always good to have some cash because when you have cash, you have liquidity, which is to say you have money to do what you need to do on a various uh, opportunities that might arise. So I, I, my own self, I try to keep a reasonable amount of money in, in cash. I recognize that there are some investors who think that holding cash is, is, is a waste of uh, an asset. Another value investor that you include in your book is John Rogers, who started a firm called Aerial Investments, and he was able to turn $10,000 into more than a billion dollars in 20 years. I think that we often think that you need a massive win or an extremely risky bet to make that kind of money, but his firm's motto is slow and steady wins the race, which is really interesting to me. Can you talk a bit about his strategy? What kind of led to his success? For those who don't know, John Rogers is an African-American man, grew up in Chicago. His parents were both graduates of the University of Chicago Law School. He was an only child. Um, he played basketball at Princeton, and in fact, was the captain of the team. And then after he graduated from Princeton, he went to work in a, an investment banking firm in Chicago. But after just two years, at the age of 24, he started his own investment firm, Ariel Capital. And uh, it is now the largest, own, largest African-American-owned investment company in the United States. And that's done quite well for, for, you know, for many, many decades. Melody Hobson is the co-CEO with him. She's a very talented uh, African-American woman who is best known to some people as the wife of, of uh, George Lucas, but she's better known to other people as a really, really talented person who's now the chairman of the board of Starbucks, among other corporate things that she does. Um, and uh, that firm has consistently had a value investing approach, which is to say, buy things that a lot less than they're really trading for and 
John Rogers did that through for difficult times in recent years because the prices were so high, he couldn't get comfortable with them. So he didn't deploy as much money as some people wanted him to deploy. But now he's able to find things at very good discounts. And I think the firm is doing quite well. Now, I'm wondering, while we often try to learn from these super investors and to try and inform our own investing strategy, are there any things that we should do differently as retail investors compared to someone who manages a really large account? Are there just any different things that we should consider? Well, retail investors should recognize that they're not principally investors, and therefore they should rely on people that are doing this full time to kind of get good insights and, and opportunities. Don't put all your money in one uh, you know, basket, for example. Uh, diversify. Don't put at risky assets more than you can afford to lose. Um, look for good managers who've been around for a while. Those are the kind of things I think people should do. And if you're a retail investor, presumably you are you have other occupations that are more important to you and you're doing other things. So if you're a doctor or a dentist, you know, you don't want to uh, spend all your time looking at, at, at screens uh, about stock prices versus, the, you know, working on your patients. Um, you know, you have a different job to do. But if you're an investor, um, it's a full time to be a full time investor, professional investor, it's a full time occupation. And you should recognize if you're a retail investor, you have other opportunities to, to, to pursue life and you shouldn't do uh, think you're a full-time investor and, and, and put too much of your time into trying to replicate what Warren Buffett has done. Remember, investing is a full-time occupation if you're going to be a professional investor. Be a great investor takes a lot of time. And just because you might be a great dentist or doctor doesn't mean you're going to be a great investor. It's a very big mistake to think that because you're a genius in, invest, in, in inventing a company that has a great product, you're also going to be a genius in investing. They're different skill sets. Two follow-ups to that. So then what do you think it takes to become a great investor for those of our listeners who want to become that, they want to get to that level? What do you think it takes? It takes a lot of hard work, dedication, focus, uh, willingness to work with other people, sharing the credit. Also, just reading, 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 just learning as much as you can. And being willing to make mistakes and admit your mistakes, I think is a very important part as well, but also focus and dedication. Also, you shouldn't expect you're going to be a great investor in one year or two years or five years. It takes a long time. The people that I have cataloged in the book and profiled have been doing each of their areas for at least a dozen years, if not 20 years or 30 years, in some cases, 40 years. So it takes a while to get to the top of the profession as it does in any profession, but it's focus, hard work, reading, getting along with people, sharing the credit, keeping your ego in check. Those are important things. And then you also mentioned the piece about diversification is key for retail investors, but I'm just wondering because concentration, even in Warren Buffett's um, investing value investing approach, concentration is kind of what led him to gain significant wealth over time. But do you think there's a certain amount of money where a concentrated bet makes sense? Or does it not make sense for retail investors if they right. are can only invest a smaller amount? I think concentrated investing is a very complicated thing for people that are retail investors and are not focused on, on a particular area or have real expertise. In the book, I describe how Stan Druckenmiller had an idea. An idea was in 1992 to short the British pound because he thought it was overvalued and would probably be devalued and decoupled uh, from other European currencies. Uh, and he talked to his then boss, uh, George Soros, who said, you know, that's a good idea. But you made one mistake. You didn't put enough money into the idea. George Soros' investment strategy historically has been if you have a good idea and really good ideas come along infrequently, pursue it to the nth degree, which is to say put a lot of money in, not just a little money. That's not something I would recommend for most retail investors. Most retail investors are not full-time investors. They can't take that risk, and they shouldn't put more money at, at risk than they can afford to lose. So I think with retail investors, the key thing is to diversify your risk and to be realistic in what your expectations or returns are. If you expect to get 25% annualized rates of return as a retail investor, I think you're in, in for a big disappointment. I think for the average retail investor, if he or she can get net internal rates returns after all fees and everything in the mid to high single digits, which is to say 
six, seven, eight percent a year consistently through thick and thin. That's pretty good. Trying to get consistently 25 percent returns or 15 percent rate returns as a retail investor is going to be difficult. You kind of touched on this before, but I'm wondering if you have any other advice. What do you think investors do wrong or where they make the biggest mistakes when trying to emulate these great investors? Is it just trying to copy their strategy or picks exactly? Well, everybody holds out the hope that they're going to find one great opportunity and that's going to make them rich or richer. And I think it's a fool's errand to some extent. Um, you can make a lot of money just by not making a lot of mistakes. And so going for reasonable rates of return, not taking undue risks, making certain you don't put things in risky assets, you can't afford to lose the amount of money in those assets is very important. But also, um, if you're a dentist or you're a doctor or you're a car salesman, you know, uh, if, a, if a great investor came in and said, geez, I'd like to learn how to be a doctor, I'd like to learn how to be a dentist, I'd like, like to learn how to sell cars, you'd probably roll your eyes and say, well, it's not that easy. You can't just get here and, and do it because you're a good investor. Every profession, every application takes a, a fair amount of time to prepare. And so don't try to be something you're not. You're not likely, if you're 50 years old and you are, let's say, a very accomplished uh, heart surgeon, you're not really going to be most likely a great investor because you just, you've passed that bridge already. Uh, now, obviously, there are some doctors I know who do become good investors, and I've met a number of them over the years. But generally, if you bet the odds, the odds are that you're probably not going to, at the age of 50, learn a new profession that is going to be called investing, and you're going to become a superstar investor. So be realistic with your expectations. That's one of the most important things I can advise people to do. What do you think are the biggest challenges that investors face today then? The biggest challenges investors, retail investors face today are there's an enormous number of opportunities. People are always advertising to invest in this or that. Um, there's an enormous number of people who like to tell you how smart they are and they might be your friends in some cases and they'll give you ideas, stock tips and so forth. Um, I think that's that's difficult to avoid being um, feeling you're missing opportunities. Remember, the smartest man in the world, in many cases, uh, at one point was thought to be Sir Isaac Newton, a brilliant man. And Sir Isaac Newton uh, invested in a company called South Sea Corporation, which the stock went up a lot. This is in the 1700s. And um, stock went up a lot. And then he sold it, made a big profit. And then the stock kept going up. He said, uh oh, I'm not as smart as I thought. I got out too soon. He went back in and put all of his money back into this company and went bankrupt. So even the smartest man in the world, uh, Sir Isaac Newton at the time, uh, makes mistakes. So even if being smart is not going to make you a great investor, it takes experience and time, and you, and you should be realistic about what you can achieve. Now, if you're a student and you're listening to me or you're reading this book, you have the potential to be a great investor in the future. There's going to be great investors in the future. We don't know who they're going to be yet, but there's no doubt it's possible. But I think it's better to start in your 20s and 30s building a great reputation as an investor and skill set than trying to start in your 50s or 60s or 70s. So for our listeners who are listening to this and they want to take their success in investing to the next level, do you think it's possible to achieve that substantial wealth through investing in just public equity markets? Or do you recommend branching out to maybe private funds or other alternative investments as well? Over the last century, the public market averages in the United States for stocks, publicly traded stocks, has been about 6% a year. In other words, stocks go up on average, maybe four to six percent a year, six percent. Um, some people would say, depending on how you measure, four percent, five percent. So what you have to say is if you're going to be a public market investor, you're going to outperform the averages year in, year out. That's very difficult to do. And that's why index funds have become so popular because most people have recognized that trying to pick stocks yourself is a very difficult thing to do. And even trying to pick managers who pick stocks is hard to do, though obviously they're very good people at doing that. Um, I would say on the whole, if you're a retail investor, probably if you're interested in public stocks, you're probably better in an index fund that tracks the market. Therefore, you know, you should probably be expecting rates of return minus, you know, fees of four to five, six percent a year, uh, you know, not counting inflation and other things. I think trying to think you're going to you're going to become a multi-billionaire investing in publicly traded stocks is a big mistake.
If you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice today, what would that be? It would be to read as much as you can about where you put your money. Um, keep up with what's going on and don't expect to get outsized returns by being an average retail investor, but you can get reasonable returns and not worry about losing your money overnight uh, when, you, when you sleep by, by backing people or investing with people that have solid track records that know what they're doing and that it will inform you on a readily available basis of how you're performing. But remember, whatever you're doing with your career, presumably you enjoy it. And if you enjoy it, don't try to become a great investor overnight by, you know, moonlighting as an investor when you have another profession. If you're a full-time investor and that's all you want to do, you have a chance to be a great investor, but it takes many, many years to learn the, the, the skill set. So on the whole, one word of advice is don't you know, have undue expectations of rates return and don't follow the market trends all the time. When people tell you now's a time, good time to invest or now's a good, good time to get out, you just have to you know, be more cautious and not try to trade all the time. Thank you so much for that advice and taking the time to speak with us today. That was an excellent conversation. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to read your book and learn more about all the investors as well and their strategies. And I want to thank you again for coming on, David. Thank you. Bye. It's more about, do you believe in what you're doing? Do you believe it's a right fit? for you? Or do you feel like for your career, you're going to be swimming against the current? You're going to swim upstream.